For Krama Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. He's a well-known activist and author, advocate Tembega Ngugai Tobi in conversation today with Polity about his new book titled Land Matters, South Africa's Faith, Land Reforms, and the Road Ahead. Mr. Ngugai Tobi, you are a practicing advocate and the author of two books about the history of our countries uh, on Black lawyers and now the land question. How do these two parts of your life intersect? They intersect in uh, a fundamental way. When I researched the land is ours, uh, probably seven, eight years ago, what I discovered was that the, I would say, first generation of black lawyers were occupied of 1913 impacts on black lives at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, that became the center of their focus as lawyers. In the current book, I start off by talking about history, but I try to resolve the contemporary question. The two questions have always been central to legal practice of black lawyers. Even today, we are still trying to grapple with how to resolve the land question, but we are still using the instrument of the law. Even where there is skepticism about the real potential of the constitution and the legal system, we are always ultimately driven back to the fundamentals of the legal system. So today we use the constitution and in particular section 25 of it. And we also use the Restitution of Land Rights Act, but we are trying to undo the legacies of the 1913 Native Land Act in pretty much the same way as someone like Pixley Gai Zagaseme, someone like uh, George Monsiwa, someone like Richard Msimang would have done had we been in 1921 rather than in 2021. And what are your suggestions to the government so that land reform can be accelerated? What I think is we need to look at the land reform, most of which is not getting attention. So we have three provisions in the constitution which deal with land tenure security, land restitution, and land redistribution. So to disaggregate them and look at each element, constitution element. The problem has been the inability of the state primarily to put in operation the instruments that are in its possession. One of them has been how to pay for land that is acquired for restitution purposes. Although the constitution says that the state should pay on a just and equitable basis, often much lower than market-related payment, State policy itself has been a contradiction because it's paid on a much higher level, so-called market-related, sometimes even higher than market-related. So one way of resolving that is implementing the existing instrument. The problem with restitution has largely been also what the land is used for, what we call post-settlement support the inability of new entrants to make use of land that has been passed on to them. That too is a consequence of the failure of the state to institute mechanisms of empowerment. Now that is not new. In one of the chapters in Land Matters, I look back to the Van Riebeek era, that when they first allocated a scheme those farmers not only got land, but they also got implements and they also got training and they also had a ready market where they could send their produce. So calling for the assistance of farmers is not because it's black farmers and therefore inherently incapable of farming, but it's simply a recognition that without 
sort of an aggressive state support program, uh, farming does not become a lucrative business. And so if you look also at the redistribution program, the problem we have there is almost a legal vacuum, the absence of laws. And perhaps one of the clear things to be done there is instituting a legal basis in terms of which people would acquire land. There is a provision in the constitution which says that land should be allocated on an equitable basis, or at the very least, access to land should be guaranteed on an equitable basis. But we, we failed to give concrete meaning to that section. I've suggested in the book that perhaps the most useful way of construing it is that land ought to be allocated on a needs basis. And then the last element is land tenure security. There are two primary challenges with land tenure security. One has been the fact that tenure in the villages, in the rural areas, or in the so-called former bandstands, is primarily controlled by chiefs and traditional authorities. That is a consequence of a misunderstanding of our custom system, which has entrenched the control of in land matters and to show that what we are engaged with is continuity of conquest and to resolve that control over the chiefs one needs to dismantle that uh, control which means conceptually one needs to engage with this idea that actually chiefly control over land is not a customary concept but it is a colonial concept and its primary purpose was indirect rule it was to impose control over land in order to exert political control and so land ultimately should be devolved downwards and not upwards as the case has been so far and it it goes without saying that uh, the the problem of corruption has slowed down the pace of land reform but if i may ask how can this now be done away with so corruption is pervasive not just on the land issue but on the entire transformation project of south africa and corruption is not just an adjunct but it's become central now to what south africa will become and until we address it squarely what it does is to threaten the ability of the democratic state to function and to deliver on the promises that are contained in the constitution. Even in relation to land, what has happened is that corruption has manifested in a multiplicity of ways. One of those ways is that people who have access to land do not get that access on merit, for instance, if they can show that they have made a claim and the claim is legitimate. Nor do they get the access to land on the basis of their ability to show that they can run successful farming projects. But they get access to it on the basis of their proximity to power. But another way in which corruption manifests is the high prices that are paid for land. In instances where the property developers would valuate an asset premium, and the question is what happens to the difference between what is recommended by the vendors and the premium that the state has paid. Now, in those instances, that premium would then be distributed across whether to land owners or to land claimants or to so what you do find is that corruption has become so endemic and so central to the land reform uh, program there is also evidence of it the siu published a report in 2017 in which it produced an astonishing figure that one out of every four claims one out of every four claims was bedeviled by corruption. Now that's a high rate of corruption that every fourth claim has corruption embedded in it. 
And those are just a sample that it assessed. We've done nothing about it. We've largely shifted sideways the problem and postponed it and uh, acted as if it doesn't exist. So it's necessary to think of corruption in much more serious ways than we have done so far. And to think of corruption as also a constraint to land reform. And one of the things I try to suggest in the book is that no longer is seen as a subsidiary problem, but it should be seen as a structural constraint to the failure or success of the land reform program. In chapter four, you address the issue of stolen cattle. Why do you say that the land dispossession will never be complete without an understanding of the loss of indigenous people's cattle? What I was surprised by myself, actually, is the fact that we know so little about how African people lost their cattle. And yet we speak so much about loss of land. There is another related topic which I discuss, I think in chapter eight or chapter nine, which is access to water. Because I see the linkages as central. So cattle were in a form of trade uh, to African people. They were like cash to African people. Although land could not be owned, cattle could also be traded. Uh, you could acquire something in exchange of cattle. You could give somebody a cow, and in exchange, they'll give you four or five sheep. You know? And that was during the era of the barter trade. You could also establish relationships using cattle. You could go and pay Lobola and establish a relationship with a completely different kingdom. So the king of the Swazi could go to the king of the Zulu and establish a relationship which was essential in times of war because it multiplied the strength of the Zulus combined with the Swazis because of the instrumentality of cattle. Cattle were also meat, they provided protein. Cattle were also labor, you could put them to work. Cattle also were a source of calcium because you could milk them. So they were so central to the society, but they also were not only central to the society as it existed, they also provided a spiritual connection to departed people. When you wanted to celebrate a new person who has been born, or you wanted to commemorate other people who are dead, or you wanted to bring their spirits you started a car. So you can see this, the multiplicity of ways in which cattle were so central to black society. So the reduction of cattle and the taking away of cattle ultimately broke not just the socioeconomic standing, it also broke the spiritual and the cultural standing of African society. When the laws like the Glen Grey Act were passed. And there are these interesting examples of tribal chiefs and just individual cattle owners who say, I used to own, let us make an example, five hectares. And in five hectares, I could keep 500 cattle. But under the Glen Grey scheme, it was one man, one hectare. One man, one hectare meant you had to get rid of the 500 and only maintain 50. What happened to the 450? A paper published by Mseman in 1916 was what happened. Because he comes to the conclusion that although a lot of people of African people of land In reality, by then, land had already been taken through the wars of conquest, which pretty much had ended by 1879 with the last war of the Zulus. The effect, therefore, of 1913, from his perspective, was that it dispossessed people of labor, of assets, and then, most importantly, of cattle. 
So it is an explanation as to why is it that a lot of farmers have so much cattle and they have Nguni cattle and African people do not because the reduction of land meant that they had to sell the cattle. And Msimang explores the terms of the trade of that selling. So you have no land, you have to get rid of the cattle. What do you do? You can't slaughter all of them. So you give them up for no consideration at all. What that means is that we need to expand our horizon of the past or perhaps past. You know, we need to expand our horizons of the past. And that looking at land as an economic asset only is a very narrow way. What we have to look at is economic injustices of the past. And if we are to reconstruct South Africa, we have to look at economic justice. And the most visible form of that economy was cattle theft. I was also surprised, advocate, to discover the story of Emma on the chapter that was about women and lead. Can you just briefly interest our viewers and tell us about the intersection that is there between gender discrimination and land policy in our country? Yes. When I started looking at that chapter in the book, I was trying to answer the contemporary question. And as you would have seen, every contemporary question starts with history and then I come to the present. When I try to look into that chapter, if you look at the, the land story, I can call it in South Africa, it is a very masculine story. If you look at the beneficiaries of the restitution program, uh, only 37% are women. If you look at the beneficiaries of the redistribution program, uh, only 40% are women. If you look at uh, farm ownership, uh, the numbers are even more astonishing. Uh, I think something like 2%, 3% are women, you know, as commercial farmers. And once you look at the numbers of black women, I mean, they, it's in the not point somethings, you know. And if you just watch television and you see land occupation, you know, in Soweto, you look at the people occupying the land, what you find is basically young men. And you look at the red ants, the people evicting the occupiers, you again find other young men, you know. And yet the paradox is that the Freedom Charter says the land shall be shared among those who work it. And if you try to answer who actually works the land and you go to KwaZulu Natal and you find the people working the gardens are women, you know? And so how did we end up with a scenario in which the rhetoric promises uh, the devolution of land to people who work it and the majority of people who work it are women. And yet we have such a masculine uh, land reform regime. So I try to look at history to find examples of women who have in the past been landowners. And history has interesting ways of uh, shaping our understandings and then sometimes confounding our understandings because it debunks a lot of myth that we are brought up with. So Emma was the eldest daughter of the king of the Nuka and the relationship between the British and the Nguyenka, which was another section of the Tosa, because the Tosas were always divided between the Njambes and the Nguyenkas. The Nguyenkas were a very powerful section, and Sandile was a much feared uh, king by the British. After 1857, with the known uh, cattle killing catastrophe, which was pacification, and the ways in which pacification would work would that the British would build up schools to enable these children of native chiefs to go back to their native communities and preach the superiority of the British. So one of the schools that were set up 
was the Zonenblom College in Cape Town. But Emma's education had to be paid for. So Bishop Gray, who was the headmaster of Zonenblom, then arranged for certain land to be kept in trust for Emma's benefit, which would then help to pay for her school fees. That was part and parcel of Gray, because of Native Chiefs, as part and parcel of his pacification and assimilation strategy. She ended up, as a result of that scheme, as the owner of two plots of land. Those pieces of land still exist. They are both known as Emma's farms. Both of them are actually in the Eastern Cape, one in the old Siskai, another in the old Trans guy. A white person, a white farmer, took over the properties and rented them over. And so I found a fascinating account of an African woman in the late 19th century as a landowner. But of course, the contradiction is that land ownership was itself embedded with the contradictions and ambiguities of British conquest because it was only because she was of royal blood and only because she was instrumental or at least perceived as an instrument of conveying the wishes, particularly Christian conversion. Ultimately, Emma rejected Christianity She wouldn't educate her own children in the traditional schools that had been set up by the British, but would do something today that we would call homeschooling. But she also would reject Christian conversion and ultimately marry a polygamous man. And in that sense, confound the wishes of her British masters. And so although she was a beneficiary of that education, she ultimately rejected it and found herself unable to conform. Her story is largely a forgotten story. And yet it is crucial to our understanding of the ways in which the British tried to convert Tosa speakers, Tswana speakers, Zulu speakers, into what another author called black Englishmen. And so I use that to anchor this debate on women and access to land ownership. But where that chapter ends is on another fascinating angle because it ends with the women of Marikana and ends with them taking control of their own circumstances no longer simply the recipients of payments of money from Johannesburg or Rustenburg to the Eastern Cape, but rather sending remittances from farming operations northwards. Because the question I'm trying to answer there is how did the strikers of Marikana sustain themselves over a period of six weeks without an income? And I find that part of the explanation for that had to do with a small farming operation on tribal land in the Eastern Cape. What that means, both the story of Emma and the story of the Marikana women, is to remind us of the 1985 song called Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves. So women are not waiting for men to empower them. They have in fact been engaged in grassroots operations what the government might do helpfully is to recognize that many women are already engaged in self-empowerment initiatives and that its function is perhaps to continue that support rather than assuming that it is starting from a blank slate. There was advocate Tembega Nugai Tobi in conversation with Polity about his book titled Land Matters, South Africa's Failed Land Reforms and the Road Ahead.